turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Not usually a chapter that is used on Christmas Sunday, but it's one that will be used today. John chapter 1. But before you get to that, I want you to follow along with me. There's a few things I want to share with you. So, prophet. What is the prophet of Christmas? Some have thought, well, prophet must mean P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Jesus must have been some kind of prophet. Of course, we know a prophet is one who foretells something that will happen. In fact, that's who John the Baptist was. John the Baptist was sent to foretell the coming of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the mighty counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. But that's not the word we're using this morning as we think of that word prophet. No, we're going to use the word prophet this morning, P-R-O-F-I-T. He said, well, Marty, what do you mean by the prophet of Christmas? Well, many of you already know that there is great prophet in Christmas. Would you not agree with me? Yeah, in fact, we live in an age today where you can sit home in your recliner, as I did, and you can order things from just about anywhere in the world. Amazon is a friend of mine. There is great profit in Christmas. In fact, if you think of the word profit, you realize that the word profit means that there is value. And because there is value, there becomes profit. When you think of the word profit, you know there is gain. There's not loss because there's profit. In fact, the next part of that definition, it says there's excess of return over the expenditure. So if you think about Christmas, if you think of the commercialization of what takes place during this time of year, even though they want to stamp out the word Christ, there's great profit in Christmas. Billions of dollars will be spent in these last couple of months up into including the day of Christmas. As much as they want to stamp Christ out of Christmas, they truly don't want to do that because there's profit in this season. Many of you have found profit not just on the financial side, but you found profit in the relationship side. How do I know that? Because there are many that are probably watching online or many that are not here because they have found profit in relationship because family members have come to the house. By the way, I never did understand when families come during the time of Christmas that they don't want to bring their families to the house of God. Notice how quiet it got in here, Clayton. I never did understand that. Pastor, you don't get it. I got a lot of folks coming over over this, this time of year, so won't be there on Sunday. Let me tell you something, folks. Now, listen, I'm not trying to throw a guilt trip, but let me share something with you. There's no greater place I would want my family to be than in the house of God. I'm sorry. Actually, I'm not really sorry. That's where they need to be. In fact, many of them say to me, well, pastor, they just don't believe like I believe. Then get them someplace that you believe in what you believe so they can see your faith. But we do find profit in relationships and having family. Susan and I are very thankful that our son called, and him and his lovely wife, Ashley, and Three of our grandchildren will be leaving the day after Christmas and coming to spend the week with us. And if they're here next Sunday, they will be in this house if I have to drag them out. But they're active in their home church, and they'll be here with us. Profit in relationships. Profit on the financial side. And then I begin to think as the Lord was bringing this message together, how do we find profit in Christmas. Well, let me share with you something that without Jesus, there is no profit in your life. Did you hear what I just said? Without Jesus Christ, there is no profit in your life. So, well, Marty, without Jesus, does that mean that I'm not going to have any money? That's not what I'm talking about. But what I am telling you that without Jesus Christ in your life, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without Jesus Christ in your life, there is no eternal life. Without Jesus in your life, there is no hope. Without Jesus Christ in your life, there is no true and pure love. Without Jesus Christ in your life, you will never find peace. This has been an incredible week. A week that I had not planned. A week that several families had not planned. Wednesday night as I was leaving church and right before I got to the doorstep of my home, I received a phone call. It was from the police department. And the police department says, Marty says, we need you right now. 
And Jeff and I traveled over to the homes of two of our family members as their mother was killed in a plane crash right here in Blairsville. That was unplanned. Had no idea that was going to happen. Nothing physically wrong with any of those four individuals in that plane. But they went up for a night to look at lights. And lives were taken. Some in this room are suffering with a disease called cancer. Some of you are suffering with other things. In fact, you may have even been given a time frame of what your life will be, as I met with one this week who said, there is no cure for my life, and I know what the end result will be. And as we had that conversation, we shifted back to the tragedy that occurred on Wednesday night when those that boarded that plane had no idea of what the end result was going to be. Now, let me share with you something. There is no prophet without Jesus Christ in your life. How many of you know today that the very moment that you leave this place, what your life will hold on this journey? You say, well, Marty, what kind of Christmas message is this? Let me tell you something. It's reality is what it is. Because we come this time of year to celebrate the greatest thing that has ever happened to man. That was the birth of a Savior, and His name is Jesus. The Word of God says that one day every name and every person will call out to Jesus. Every knee will bow. I wonder how many of those will call out to Jesus and say, Save me. And Jesus will say, But I didn't know you. I never heard from you. You never asked me. It's too late. Prophet of Christmas. Turn with me to John chapter 1, verse 1. A most unusual place of Scripture to go to for this time of year. But the Lord spoke to me this week as everything was unfolding, everything was happening, and I began to think, Lord, what is the greatest prophet of Christmas? And this is where he brought me. John chapter 1. In the beginning... Now, will you bear with me for just a moment as I share something with you that in the beginning we know what happened. God created the heavens and the earth. Y'all remember that, right? We go on to chapter 2 of Genesis, and we find out that God saved his best for last, and guess what? He saved the best for last, me and you. And you know why he created us? For one reason, fellowship to love him and praise him. You know what we did this morning? We came into this house, we lifted our voices, and we praised Jesus. In the beginning, notice this, was the Word. Notice the word W is capitalized. In the beginning was the Word. What does it say? And the Word was what? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is our triune God. In the beginning, Jesus was there. And not only Jesus was there, but Jesus is our God. Amen, church? So in the beginning, when everything was being created, when you and I were being created, Jesus was there. In that chapter, it goes on and it says, He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him, what's it say, church? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. I'm here to tell you this morning that the very breath that you breathe at this very moment comes from the goodness and the greatness of God. The very breath that you breathe this morning is provided by God. How could we take anything less from who He is? How many of you would agree with me that that breath of life is precious? Amen? As we see it from this perspective on this side of heaven, the very breath of life came from our Father. The very breath of life that we breathe this morning comes from our Father. Now you're seeing me pull out the notes. See, we just got started. 
You're going to eat this morning here, I pray. But I pray this morning you're going to eat from the bread of life before we get into anything else. Now, I want to take you to something that I think is very, very important this morning as we consider this message, as we look at who our Savior is, and we go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. It says, He came into this world, He came to be like men, and was born in human form. And you heard just a moment ago in that monologue, as we think that the angel came to Mary, the angel came to Joseph and said, Hey, listen, you're going to have a baby. And they both looked at one another and said, wait a minute, we have not any, had any kind of human relationship whatsoever. How is this possible? And the angel says that you'll conceive of this child of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ came to this earth to take upon himself my flesh. Now, if you do any kind of analyzation as it reads, as to what that word means, you will go back and you will find out that those that were of the religious day, they used the word deity because the word flesh was considered nasty and filthy and dirty. Jesus took upon himself my flesh. Has anybody in this room ever hit their finger with a hammer? Am I the only one that's ever done that? Now, I'm going to tell you, it hurts. Anybody ever kick the side of a chair with no shoe on? Y'all ever figured out that the smallest things on your body are the things that hurt the most when something happens? Anybody ever got a paper cut and you whined all day about it? Hey, let me ask you a question. Anybody ever been lied about? Has that ever happened to anybody in this room? Has anybody ever been forsaken by a friend? Has anybody ever been betrayed? Let me tell you what, when Jesus came to this earth, he took upon himself your flesh and my flesh. He felt the same pain you feel. The Word of God says that God came to be with us. I don't know about you, but I can relate to Jesus when I've got pain. Amen, church? I can relate to him when I hurt I can relate to him when I'm lied about. I can relate to him when I'm betrayed because all of those things happen to Jesus. Yet he lived on this earth without sin. I don't know what, <laughs> about you, but when I stubbed my toe and had hit my finger with my hammer, I've had to go to the altar. Has that happened to you? Have you all had to get down on your knees and say, Lord, forgive me? I don't know about you, but when I've been lied about and I've been <laughs> betrayed, I've had to go to the altar and ask the Lord to forgive me of what I thought of that person for what they did. Just the other day, I had to call Brother Clayton, and I was chatting with him. I heard somebody said some things about me that were so untrue, and I said, Clayton, you need to pray for me, buddy. This person's got no idea what this old man's capable of. Did I not say that? And I called him up the other day, and I said, man, what I said to you, I need to apologize, because that's not me. That's not me. But that was the anger that flowed from me. I know what it's like to be lied about. Isn't it amazing that as Jesus was hung on the cross, taking your sins and mine, he looked down and he said, Father, forgive them. I'll tell you what, if I'd have been hanging on that cross, I'd have said, I'd have said Father, take them out. Send the legions of angels and take them out. So I thought about the prophet of Christmas and the reality that sunk to me is that Jesus came and he took upon himself my flesh. This little baby came in a manger and took upon himself the form of a human being and to feel all of the pain, to feel all of the agony. The word of God also says that there was a time that he had to rest as they were along their journey. He grew weary. There was a time he was with the woman at the well and asked her for something to drink, so he had to be thirsty at one time. You see, he felt everything that you feel, except he was sinless. God with us. We celebrate the birth of a Savior as I told you as I was walking up here, there's no more emotional time for me than to realize of what takes place this time of year. You say, well, Marty, isn't the cross an emotional time? Yes, but you see, without the birth of a Savior, there would have been no cross. God had a plan. His plan was to send the Word. 
His plan was to send His Son, Jesus. But for no other reason, none whatsoever, but to go to the cross for you and for me. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 16, and I'm reading this from the uh, New Letters translation, it says, Christ is the visible image of an invisible God. God with us. He existed before God, and He made everything. Quite Christ is the one through whom God created everything in heaven and in earth, and God sent Him so we could see Him. And I thought about that. Well, what could we see? I thought about my Savior. What do we see in Him? Now, if you go through this book, and you take time, and you read it, I don't know about you, but I see God's love in Jesus. You see that? You see God's love in Jesus? You know, for those 33 years he walked the earth, we see God's love because he had compassion. He met the needs of those that had a need. Wouldn't you not agree with me? You heard the song. Man, I get so wrapped up in that song. Mary, did you know? What a scriptural-based song that is. Jesus made the blind to see. He made the lame to walk. Do you, do you remember that woman as Jesus was walking in this crowd and, and they were all pressed against him? You know what that word pressed means? It means that, that there were so many people there that they were literally actually smothering one another. Their bodies were touching. That's what that means. You see, I remember that moment as Jesus was walking, and the Word of God says they were pressed together. In fact, he was headed to Jairus' house, and there was a young girl that had passed and was going to heal her. In fact, he had told Jairus, don't worry about it. She's just sleeping. Y'all remember that? Oh, the Word of God, I love it. And this woman touches the very hem of the garment of Jesus. Anybody ever been in a crowd, people pressing all over you, hot and sweaty, stinky, and all that stuff? Am I the only one that's been in one of them crowds? I don't like crowds, by the way. I like my space. But they were all pressing against Jesus. And I remember being in crowds like that that I don't like because I don't like all that stuff squishing on top of me. I like my space. You know why? Because people were all touching you. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You feel everything. And I thought, how was it that Jesus felt someone touch the very hem of the garment? You know what it says? The Word of God says that that very moment, the very power of Jesus flowed to that woman. The Word of God says, he turned around and says, the very power exited me. Who was that? And that woman, you must imagine that she was probably scared to death and thinking, oh, no, 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 no. But she stepped up and said, it was me. That very moment, the woman that touched the hem of the garment of Jesus, by her faith believing, was healed of an illness she had had for years. There's profit in Jesus. There's profit in Christmas. You know, we could go on and on and on, and we could talk about stories in this incredible book. But you know what? When I think of the word stories, sometimes that word leads us to believe that they're not true. Because everything in this book is true. Jesus came to this earth. God came to dwell among us. Well, I... I, continue to think about how the Lord continued to put this message together, and I thought, well, Lord, you came here for one reason. You you came here to show us your love. You came to be with us. You, You came to exemplify all the character traits of a loving God, of a God that has grace for us, a a God that reveals himself by his power, by the very accounts of what you've done as we read these scriptures, but you came for a purpose. With the gift of grace, God came to save you from your sins. Think about that word. It's the excess 
of an expenditure, a debt that was due. Profit in Jesus. Now listen to me very carefully this morning. We were born into a sin nature. The Word of God says, but by one man's sin, sin entered into the world. Sin came upon us because of man's sin. But by the obedience of one. But by what Jesus did on the cross, salvation is offered to all. Christmas. The prophet of Christmas. Jesus. Coming to earth, exemplifying the character of God, showing all of his power, but yet goes to a cross. You see, God knew that the only way that the sin debt of man could be paid was by the only thing that could be taken as a payment that was perfect and spotless that would pay all of that debt over and over again. And that would be his son, Jesus. God with us. God showing all of his power. But God going to the cross to pay for your sin and mine. There's profit in Jesus. You all know the verse. I don't have to stand up here and quote it to you. If you need to look it up, it's John chapter 3, verse 16. If you haven't memorized it, this should be a, ver a verse that, that you carry with you everywhere you go. The gospel in one verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You should be able to stand up here and quote that verse over and over again. For God so loved the world. God so loved you, Gary, and Debbie, and Toby, and Duke. For God so loved Marty that he gave, he sent his son to a manger. That whosoever, Duke, and Gary, and Debbie, and Scott, and Vanessa, Marty, who believes should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 10.10 10 says that not only life, but life abundant. You know what that means? That means Marty's rich. Oh, yes, I am. I don't know about you, but the very moment that I made Jesus Christ the Lord of my Savior, there was a peace that comes that no one could ever explain. There's a love that comes that no one else can explain. I was talking with a woman this week, and she says, Pastor, I want you to know something. There's, there's some things in my life that, and it's just tough. I feel like I'm all alone. But the reality is I'm never alone because my Father's with me. Anybody ever felt alone but realized you weren't alone? God was right there. There's peace. When no one else loves you, God loves you. Again, just this past week, a gentleman shared with me, he says, Pastor, you just don't get it. You don't understand what I've gone through. People have thrown me out, consider me trash, don't care for me, don't, they just don't want nothing to do with me. And I said, but there is one that does. In fact, he loved you so much, he sent his son for you to go to a cross for you because he loves you that much. And my friend, there's nothing you could ever do that would keep you from God's love. All you got to do is believe what Jesus did for you. And I thought about that, the prophet of Christmas and, and what Jesus has done for me. In John, 3, John chapter 3, verse 5, it says that he became a man so that, we, that he could take away our sins. 
In Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Though he was God, he laid aside his mighty power and the glory of taking the disguise of a slave and becoming like men. He humbled himself even further, going so far as to actually die for criminals. You see, that's what we are. Born into sin. And God sent his son to give of his life for you and for me. On the screen this morning are the very things that the Holy Spirit touched me with as we come to wrap up this message. The prophet of Christmas, God revealed his character to us, who he is. And God revealed to us the very grace that came and it was given, the very gift. God provided through this birth of a Savior the provision for a sin debt that could only be paid by Jesus Christ. And God provides for us an eternal life through Jesus Christ. If we go all the way back in the last verse I'm going to give you this morning, and I want you to focus on this verse. It's right back in John chapter 1. I don't want you to miss this in verse number 12. It says, but as many as received him. You see, this week, this was not the message I had planned. We were going to be in Luke chapter 2. But everything that unfolded this week, this is the message God wanted me to bring to you. That verse that says, but as many, I thought to myself, Friday night, I knew about the one but I did not know about the others on that plane. You see, I have no idea what is the condition of their life. And the only reason I would know about the one is because of what was expressed of me, of what was shared with me. Now, in this room, there are almost 200 folks. There are children upstairs. But I'm here to tell you that I know about this one. I know that there was a moment when I kneeled on the ground and I put my face on the floor and I said, Jesus, I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I believe in what you did on the cross for me. And my life changed. See, I know about me. See, I'm one of the many. But I don't know about you. I don't know about you. Oh, I could probably sometimes guess. The Word of God says we'll exemplify those things in our life and who we believe and who we walk with. Amen, church? Write this down as we draw this to a close, please. I shared this maybe last week, maybe a couple of weeks ago because it is really pressed upon my heart. This past week, I wrote an article and had it put in the paper. Thank you, Allison, for doing that because of what the name Jesus means to me, and it means salvation. I will promise you this, at least this is my prayer, that whoever read that article got the gospel in it. There's no excuse Let me share something with you I've learned. I've learned it more so since I've lived here in 11 years than I've ever learned it in my life. See, I'm a Miami boy. I came from South Florida. When you went to church, you went because you loved Jesus. When I moved to the South, you go to church because that's what people do. Am I wrong, Clayton? Don't come to this church because it's something to do. You come to this church because you serve the King of Kings. There's a lot of folks that call themselves Christians. You listen to me, but they are not. Let me share with you something that I have learned over these last few weeks. The word Christian has been abused and used till it almost has no meaning whatsoever. Let me tell you what I am. I am a Christ follower. I'm a Christ follower. Because if you believe in something... You'll follow it. You say, well, pastor, what does that mean? Ask yourself this. What are you following today? What are you following? Do you follow Christ? Is there a desire for you to be with God's people? Is there a desire? I shared a moment ago, and I'll hear about this on some emails this week, I'm sure. 
When your family's there and you know that they don't know Jesus Christ, do you have a desire for them to get to know him? Or is it more about let's hang out around the tree and get some presents? Let me tell you something. You know why the Lord brought me this message? Because time is short. You have no idea. What if you were in that plane looking at Christmas lights? I'm a Christ follower. How about you? That little baby came in a manger for you. That was the only purpose, the only reason that baby came for you. The Word of God says, for as many, I pray that you're one of the many. Notice what it says. For as many that have received him. I mean, you know what that means? Hey, listen, you know what that means? That doesn't mean that you came here because you wanted to have a place to sit. That doesn't mean that you came here today and you sat in this place because you wanted to earn some points with God. Let me tell you something. If you have not received the salvation of Jesus Christ, you are dead in your sins. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you pass from this life, you will go to a place called hell. I can't put it any more clearer than that. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I will promise you, when times get tough, when the road gets, gets hard and it's bumpy, you won't find peace. You will not find joy. And when those others leave you, you'll not have love. But you can have that in Jesus this morning. When people forsake you and lie about you, you can have the comfort and the peace of God because you've got Jesus in your life. The Word of God says, look at this. Please don't miss this. But as many that have received Him, I want to stop right here. There's no heads looking up this way. I want you to, I want you to bow your heads for me. Come on. Come on. You say, well, Pastor, man, what a message. Bow your head. I want to get serious with you. We're talking about the birth of a Savior. Let's get serious. But as many have received Him, this morning I have poured into you the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've sung songs about it. A gentleman this past week said, you know what, in three days the Christmas music stops. And then one guy was funny and says, well, you know, I had to laugh at it. He says, well, it all starts over again in July. Why is that? Because of the prophet of Christmas. The financial prophet, listen to me. I'm talking to you this morning. Listen, I want you to see the prophet in your life today before you leave this house. Set aside what you've been calling yourself. Set aside that you showed up today in this house. Set aside that you, you know, you sing in the choir, you do children's ministries, you put money in the offer plate. Listen, let's get down to the brass tacks this morning. Let's let the rubber hit the road. Ask yourself this. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Has there been a moment in your life when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? One person told me that they were a Christian this week because they had a cemetery plot. Good for you. Listen. Right now, you ask yourself that one very simple, but I'm going to tell you what that question could be the determination of what happens to you the rest of your life. You see, I don't know what tomorrow brings. Millions of people, including my son and daughter-in-law and, and our three grandchildren, and I pray for their safety every moment. We'll be traveling up here from Fort Lauderdale this weekend. And I pray, Lord, put your heads of protection around them because I don't know what can happen. I worked many of those accidents for years, 28 years, of those who were traveling to Disney World and all these places had no idea that the very moment someone was going to cross the center line and take the life of their family. The Word of God says, but as many have received Him, to them He gave the right to become the children of God. That verse says to those that received him, Jesus does not force himself on you. Jesus says, if you'll receive me, I'll give you life and life abundant. Jesus says, if you receive me, you become a child of God. 
Listen to that verse again. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. You see, that's what I wrote in this article this week. It's all about the name of Jesus. My dear friend, there is no other name that you can call on for your salvation except the name of Jesus. There is no other name that will give you access to the throne room of God except the name of Jesus. There is no other name, no other person that died on a cross except Jesus. There is no other name, no other person that walked out of the tomb but the name Jesus. If you've never called upon Jesus this morning to be your Lord and your Savior, the Word of God also says now is the appointed time. You may never have this moment again. 